My name is Mary Conquest. I'm your host for Safety Labs by Slice, the podcast where we explore the human side of safety to support safety professionals. We move past regulations and reportables to talk about the core skills of safety leadership, empathy, influence, trust, rapport, in other words, the soft skills that help you do the hard stuff. Hi there. Welcome to Safety Labs by Slice. On this podcast, we do our best to invite guests from every corner of the safety world. As a result, I've spoken with academics, novice safety managers, psychologists, authors, and veterans of the profession. Many align with one of two orientations towards safety. These perspectives are variously referred to as command and control versus the new view, safety one versus safety two, or traditional safety versus safety differently. Is one of these approaches more effective than the other? Why did people feel that the standard safety methods were lacking? Is safety differently a natural evolution of the practice, or is it really no different than the thinking from earlier generations? Our guest today has explored these questions in her own work and sees merit and fault in different approaches to safety management. Elisa Lynch is a health, safety, and environmental manager in the construction industry. She's a frequent guest on safety podcasts. Elisa has strong opinions and strong language, so if you have delicate ears or have someone in the room with delicate ears, please adjust accordingly. Elisa has worked in Sydney, Australia, and her native Ireland, both in the workplace, health, and safety space, and in employee management and training for over a decade. In that time, she's been involved in commercial and residential construction and traffic control safety. Elisa has experience in both Safety 1 and Safety 2 practices and has applied her analytical mind and observational skills to understanding what works and what doesn't. Along the way, she's learned to improve safety outcomes and set people up for success one conversation at a time. Ms. Lynch joins us from Cork, Ireland. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Let's <laughs> get excited. right. Let's get right into it. Um, because we might ruffle some feathers, and in fact, I hope we do, because it means people <laughs> are listening and thinking about their own views. Tell me a bit about your particular experience in safety management. What influence do you think your industry experience might have on how you view safety, in contrast to someone working in, in a very different setting? Okay, so. All of my experience comes from construction. So everything is, I view it all through that lens and how it has shaped my view. Of it. I guess when I started out in, in safety, it was very much traditional command and control, people doing stupid things. That's how accidents happen. They just weren't paying attention and very much a shame, blame and retrain response. And I worked in that kind of environment for well, it's probably probably five or six years, I suppose. And it made me hate the job, to be honest. I really didn't enjoy it. If I was out in the pub and somebody asked me, hey, what do you do for work? I'd be like, oh, Christ, I really don't want to fucking say <laughs> that I'm a safety officer. Like, that's like the, the least nice job to have. <laughs> like, people don't respond well. I'm like, oh, Christ, here we go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's where I started out. Um, and that has very much, yeah, shaped my view of, of safety management and how that can go really wrong. It can go really against you. Uh, it can be really hard to get traction that way. Uh, so, yeah. Did I answer the question? You did. You did, for sure. And I mean, of course, so, you can't say, like, if my experience was in office situations then blah, mm. blah, blah, because that's not your experience. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to start by orienting the conversation around um, your understanding of the concepts that we're talking about. So we'll no doubt end up using these terms as shorthand. So let's get a sense of how you understand, uh, we'll, we'll call them safety one and safety two. And here's the critical bit, how you understand them as defined by their practitioners or advocates okay uh so safety one or traditional safety um i would understand as 
command and control. I would understand it as a very rigid system where you are doing safety to people, Mm. basically. And safety to or safety differently or new view, I would understand it to be a more collaborative approach where you are doing safety with people and more specifically with the people who are at the point of risk. Right. So traditional safety, safety management plans, risk assessments, all that jazz done from behind a desk and, and, and sent out from upon high. And, <laughs> um, and, then, and then the kind of more uh, new view would be more collaborative. That's my That's, take on what they, on, on how those they, people yeah, are. On how they view it. Okay, so yep. now we'll jump into uh, what do you mean when you say safety one, commander control, traditional safety. And I'm throwing these terms all in the same bucket. Uh, so please let me know if that's a misconception. Um, but how do you see these ideas showing up in practice? In practice, I suppose I see traditional safety showing up as safety officers marching around with clipboards, <laughs> pissing people off. Like, and, and I say that because I've been that person. Like who's your man that parted the waters (laughs) like literally walking through a site and people are just fucking scattering as you're coming because they don't want to talk to you um so yeah that would be um that's my view of it that's how I would describe it uh versus when I take a more I suppose new view collaborative approach it's you're walking through site and people are happy to see you coming and they're like, hey, how's things? And you can have a conversation and have a chat and uh, and people come to you with problems versus I would have found in, in my experience of a, a traditional approach, people would hide things. Right. So very much under reporting, cover up of things, all that kind of jazz. So um, when I say safety to the new view or safety differently, is it is it fair to throw those all kind of into a bucket i'm sure there are nuances but there are look there are nuances um and but i would throw look i'd throw them all into a bucket there's too many books <laughs> to read <laughs> to to even get on top of oh like safety to resilience engineering all this kind of jazz uh i'm sure there's probably people going to be listening to this going she has no fucking clue <laughs> i to be honest i i put them all in one bucket okay um, well i mean fair so enough and that's for me that's what we need to sort of um set out as so people understand the conversation the way that that you're understanding it um yeah so i think it's clear to me that if traditional safety was foolproof if, if it worked 100 percent, then there would be no new view um how do you think new view advocates define the deficits of the traditional view um and why did they feel that there was a need to re-examine safety management practices i think the need came from stagnation like traditional safety has only been able to bring us so far even if you look at uh fatality statistics you know at national levels or international levels um it's not getting better it's just stagnating um and there's there's a reason for that it's that it's like what's the definition of madness doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result the different result wasn't coming. We have not achieved zero harm. We won't achieve zero harm. But like, I don't believe in in zero harm anyway Mm. as a management trope or goal or whatever way they want to make out that it's, oh, it's a goal. It's something to work towards. And if you say that you're anti-zero harm, it's also you're pro-accidents. It's like, (laughs) no, I'm not (laughs) pro-accidents, but like fucking hell, zero harm is clearly, I think, damaging to safety culture if you can say safety culture is a thing um and yeah so i think people were frustrated with the traditional approach probably frustrated with you know going to work every day and and, and being the person that people walk away from mm. that's it's not a fun it's a lo- it can be a lonely job uh, especially if you're a team of one uh, which a lot of safety professionals are and where people don't want to engage with you uh, because you're out with your clipboard just drilling rules all the time without understanding maybe why people can't or won't follow the rules. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's where the new view 
was born out of that frustration of we need to do something different. And maybe, crazy idea, the people doing the work might have the answer to <laughs> how we should do that. <laughs> so uh, I know that some, some thoughts and research ha- have, has gone back at least to the 80s. Do you think Safety 2 is really new or do you think it's a case of rebranding old ideas? I don't think it's new. Um, I probably did when I heard about it first. I was like, oh, mind blown. This is unbelievable. (laughs) And actually, the first time I had heard about it, I was at a workshop in Sydney by one of the kind of, I suppose, the thought leaders, one of the founders of Safety Differently. And I thought (laughs) he was crazy. I was like, this is never going to take off. This is never going to become a thing. But um, yeah, it's. I think maybe they've just, and it might be social media, it might be that kind of thing that has has gained traction for these ideas, or maybe it's just really um, engaging people, the likes of the Sydney Deckers and those who who are, I suppose, drawing people in. They're they're engaging, uh, they're controversial. I don't think the ideas are new. Uh, I was actually I was doing a uh, I went back to university two years ago, and uh, I was doing. An assignment, and next thing I was reading up on James Reason or something. It was from like late eighties, early nineties, and it was all about organizational drift. I was like, "Hang on a second. <laughs> I was like, "This shit's from the nineties. <laughs> this isn't new." Um, but the, what I will say is that I hadn't ever heard of any of the theories before. When I was working in, when I was engaged with traditional safety. You kind of go into a company. This is, again, this is my experience of it. You go into a company, the safety management system is set up. Mm-hmm. It's there. And you just, you slot in and then you just keep the cogs turning. There's no real creativity in it. There's no, there's nothing new in it. So they, they don't need to tell you what the background is or where these theories came from. It's set. There it is. There you go. Just follow the system. Whereas I guess with New View, because it was under such scrutiny, you do have to go, well, well, where has this come from? Mm. And if they can, now they probably could refer back a bit more to some, and could credit a bit more, I think, on some of the ideas that are out there. Now, don't shoot me. I haven't read all the Safety Differently books. Maybe they are citing more than what I realize. I get a lot of my info from LinkedIn, blogs. But uh, yeah, that's, um, that's my take on it. Okay, so in that evolution, um is there anything valuable that you think got lost along the way? Are we in danger of losing sight of solid practices or principles by equating traditional with ineffective? Yes, there is absolutely a place for traditional safety management. There will always be, and especially in high hazard industries where some stuff you just need to control it and you need to make sure those controls are in place and that needs to come from a command center you know, confined space entry, these kind of things. You can't fuck around with that. Like it needs to be a certain way that's not negotiable. It's not wisdom of the crowd stuff. That's these are the rules and they have to be that way, full stop. And and you think that has to do with risk, like maybe the higher the risk or, you know, uh Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there there are there are certain <clears throat> there are certain hazards, I guess, that we know what they are and we know how to control them. That's been figured out. Mm -hmm. And it is a case of then training and ensuring there's that current competency with the people doing the work and and, and supporting them to do that work is ensuring that they have that competency. Um, You know, that's... So those those kind of things, you can do elements of new view with it in maybe your approach to figuring out their understanding, that... You can have cool conversations or little learning teams around stuff versus what I would see as the traditional one, which is read it, sign it, do it, you know? Um, But at the same time, whether it's new view or traditional control, those control measures are the same. They have to be in place for confined space entry, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The laws of physics aren't going to (laughs) change. Like, you know, this shit's going to kill you. Um, New view, (laughs) maybe not. (laughs) That's Yeah. Okay, so now, so we kind of looked at some deficits on both sides. So tell me what you feel is really working with each perspective, the new and the old. Um, I suppose with the old is structure. There's, from a 
I suppose a practitioner point of view, it's 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 very much it's a system is there to follow. The structure is there. The 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 history of how things have been done is there. It's, there's a comfort in that, rightly or wrongly. There's a comfort in it, and there's a comfort for everyone at all levels of the organization, which matters. You know, there has to be. <laughs> I have walked into boardrooms all excited being like, oh my God, let's do new view safety. And the board are like, sorry, what? Like, <laughs> no, absolutely fucking no way. What are you even talking about? This is not happening. So, you know, they need to be comfortable with it. They need to understand. And traditional safety, definitely, it's the known. Yes. So, yeah. um, and, it, and it has Oh, absolutely saved lives like there's there is no doubt about it that traditional safety management has has brought us an extremely long way but it will only take us so far i think um so yes there there are there are good things about it um good things about the new view the new view wouldn't exist without traditional safety right it, it just wouldn't it can't um so it builds on that but it's not either or it's and like you have to have both. You can't just you can't just get rid of everything. And I think people from probably a more traditional standpoint maybe get defensive about new view safety and be like, oh, they're just saying throw everything out and just leave it to all the guys on the ground and they can figure it out. And this is crazy. Like nobody is saying that. Like literally, not one fucking person has ever said that. <laughs> it's that is an extreme exaggeration of what new view safety is. So new view for me is very much building on what you have with your traditional safety management system. It is not scrapping everything. It's actually really testing it. I suppose it's it's I would say it's it's giving it more assurance that what you have in your traditional system is working because you're looking at it in a different way with more curiosity, more engagement. Right. If that makes sense. So really your your just because you're questioning how things are done doesn't mean that you're saying everything is done poorly. It just sort of opens up that curiosity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that a lot of proponents of safety differently, for example, would say that it's research-based rather than assumption-based. So in other words, they, they didn't come along and just dismiss Grandpa Simpson for no reason. They have qualitative and quantitative research to back up their ideas. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that body of research? Um, I Some of it's fairly hard going, to be honest, to read. Um, I think reading research is dull if you're not like <laughs> really into it. <laughs> um, so it can, be, it can be quite inaccessible. Um, but I will say, and I think it was actually... Um, referenced by one of the other people you interviewed, uh, Dave Proven and Drew Ray do a fantastic podcast, The Safety of Work, mm -hmm. where they 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 do the hard work for you. They'll read the research paper for you and then they'll distill it into a podcast and you can kind of get the takeaways. So um, I find that really helpful. But yeah, like research in general, I, I find hard going to read it. So I don't find it very accessible. So when it comes to New View, I would very much lean on the experiences of people doing the work versus information from academics. Right. If that makes sense. Like I want, I want to hear from someone who has done it mm. and somebody who isn't going to try and sell me a book for me to find out how they've done it. Right. I just want to know. <laughs> do you think, and, and those, those people are few and far between. Um, do you think, what do you think is the place of that kind of academic research, though, do, do you think it is also, it may not be inaccessible on the ground? Do you think that it's useful to have? Or do you think it's just, um, do you think we kind of know what we know already and it's more about implementation now? Um, no, I wouldn't say that we know what we know. Definitely. Like, it definitely has a place. Um, I'd love to be more into it. <laughs> I'd love to find it easier to read. Uh, no, it definitely has a place. And but there probably isn't near enough of it. Like if you think of the scale of the amount of work happening versus the amount of research we have mm. in either tradition or new view, there's, sure, there's probably not nearly enough. And even then, they're probably still very Western kind of 
like again looking at a global scale of work and how good are we really on a global scale at safety probably not great Mm. um so there's lot there's still loads more to do i think i just won't be the one doing it or reading it (laughs) um when so that makes me wonder too you've worked in australia and ireland Mm -hmm. in safety do you notice um and i'm sure you have colleagues that you've spoken with in other countries um not to start any kind of <laughs> nationalist <Start or>. debates. <laughs> um, what differences do you see? Like, do you think that the regulatory environment um, makes a difference? Or do you think what's happening on the ground affects it? Or would you characterize sort of Australian safety as different in any way from Irish safety? Oh, Jesus, Irish safety. Yeah, we're, uh, we're way behind. Like, we're behind everyone. We're behind traditional we're behind new view. Like you could walk onto a construction site at the end of my road now and be like, is it 1985? <laughs> like real, like really now there are, some, there are, there are some great people doing great work in safety here, but there are, I suppose there are so many smaller businesses and smaller contractors that just like this, even this conversation, they wouldn't even know what the hell we're talking about. Mm. Um, versus I suppose in Australia, they're kind of, um, they have a monopoly on, on safety academics over there. They all live over there. Um, but they, even though it's, I left Australia in 2017. And at that time, I didn't see safety differently or any new view stuff on the ground. It was not uh, okay. a thing. It wasn't happening. So I think it's starting to uh, probably gain traction now. Um, the regulators there... Uh, the regulators in Ireland, pff, yeah, they're not. Um, well, look, they're under resourced, like every regulator, I guess. Yeah, they're they're under resourced. Um, they're very much, um, they're there to police and to punish. They're not there to engage or to guide or to help. Like you would absolutely not ring the health and safety authority in Ireland and go, "Hey, I have a question." They'd be like, "Why don't you already know? I'm going to fine you." So, um, <laughs> well, just it's... do not pick up that phone. Uh, I did find the regulator in Australia um, more engaging. Um, there was a few inspectors that I could pick up the phone to once I kind of had engaged. Once I'd, I suppose, interacted with them a few times, I could pick up the phone and be like, "Hey, what do you think about this?" And they'd say, "No, you're." I think part of that too might just be the nature of the beast, right? I mean, they, mm. by the nature of being a regulatory body, they have to come w- up with regulations and rules, um, yeah. probably more so than guidelines, although maybe it's moving that way. But, um, mm. you know, things do have to be a bit black and white if you're going to talk about monetary, like fines or mm. that kind of and thing. Yeah, and they, they, they do have to enforce like Mm -hmm. you need an enforcing body um but that's not say that body couldn't have an arm that is true yeah advisory and helpful and not scary and terrifying (laughs) because if you scare me and terrify me i'm going to hide stuff from you and i'm not going to go to you for help yeah exactly where does that get anyone so interesting that you say that you hadn't you haven't yet so have you seen um safety differently sort of in practice you mentioned that it was the ideas were kind of out there but they hadn't quite trickled down have you since seen them trickle down anywhere or um i i suppose i've spoken to a few people who would have it in practice now um have i seen it myself i suppose only from my own practice in the Mm -hmm. company that i work with of trying to do my own things with it um which has gone well um but not not a massive scale I suppose. And then the other thing is, I think I'm kind of probably in an echo chamber as well, like on the likes of LinkedIn and people I network with, we're all very much, Mm -hmm. we kind of go, this is getting traction. This is going to be great. And then you realize, okay, there's like a hundred of us in the whole world. (laughs) So (laughs) So this is not representative. (laughs) Like it's, you know, it's not representative. We're definitely all going, yeah, we're great. This is brilliant. This is getting there. And then you go, hang on a second. No, it's probably not. Take the blinkers off. Well, but you know, I mean, uh, in order for people to follow, somebody has to lead, right? Um, yeah. Th- that's the way with any kind of social change. And speaking of change, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about, you know, running into the boardroom and saying, safety differently, <laughs> we're going to do it, blah, blah, blah. And everyone being like, 
back up the bus. Like, yeah. what are you even talking <laughs> yeah. about? Who are you who hired this person? <laughs> and, yeah, literally have had that moment. Um, so I have heard from many, many safety managers that their most difficult um, task is to get buy-in. I think it's often getting buy-in from people sort of on the floor, as it were, but it's also getting buy-in from management um, mm. and managing organizational change. Um, what would you, what's your experience with that? Like you've already said, like, don't run in there <laughs> and, uh, don't do like, what I did. <laughs> don't do what I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, don't do what I did. Cause you have to really know your stuff. And I was just so hyped and excited at this idea. I was like, this has got to be unreal. And they were like, calm the fuck down. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so I would say, um, sorry, repeat the question again. Um, just, I guess, yeah, it wasn't really formed as a question just about buy-in, <laughs> like buy-in for, yeah, for management. Let, you know, how would you, what do you know about that? Like, what have you learned? What do you think you've said? What doesn't work? Have you found things that do mm. work? Or again, maybe just heard that certain things get traction from other people. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I'd have like, in terms of buy-in, I what I've had the I suppose the best experience with is I did the whole run in and talk about safety differently and that didn't really fly <laughs> so then I kind of regrouped I was like oh shit what am I gonna do <laughs> so I just kind of started to do it anyway mm. and when I don't I don't mean I went rogue I mean I literally <laughs> just started speaking <laughs> to the guys on the ground in a different way asking different questions and engaging with them differently. And I just kind of forgot about the board for a while. Right. Like, if I, because I just need to do what I'm doing with, with the guys at the point of risk. And then it'll start to speak for itself. Right. And then when the board see that, oh, geez, the lads are actually engaging with Elisa. Oh, the, the lads are not running in the opposite direction <laughs> from her. <laughs> They're actually picking up the phone going, hey, we've got a problem here. Can you come down and help us out? Or, hey, we've had an injury and we're actually telling you about it. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff. And when, when they see that and they're like, how did you, what, what is this? What's happening? And then I can say, oh, well, actually, I've been reading X blog or listening to this podcast. And they say that maybe if we don't treat people like shit, it could <laughs> work really well for us. <laughs> if we try, I if just, we try this. I just, yeah. Yeah. But, um, and actually, I was on... Um, a kind of networking webinar thing the other week and a guy called Simon Bowen was on there giving a keynote and he introduced safety differently at Luton Airport and he was actually saying a lot of the same things that I was kind of going oh actually I have been I have been doing this okay for the last while from hearing him speak about it that he was like you know it takes time it's not like it takes a long time so what you're doing is planting seeds. You mm -hmm. just got to figure out where you're going to plant them. And that could be by changing your language or whatever that is. Like I used this phrase of, I'm saying used, not coined. I'm not that, like I'm not saying I made this up. <laughs> but I used this phrase of setting people up for success. And I just kept using it over and over again, every opportunity I had. And then about six months later, I heard one of the directors say to someone in my earshot going yeah but how do we set this guy up for success I nearly did a fucking jig in the hallway outside the office I was like yes <laughs> that is a slow burn but it happened and that was a big win it's like so you I suppose you have to change your um view on what wins are as well I would say definitely if you're looking for wins it's those kind of small wins where you see this is this is catching on literally one conversation at a time yeah yeah, patience, patience. And patience, yeah, I'd play the long game. And, and eventually they will see when you hear the language of the board start to change, when you hear that kind of engagement and empathy from them for the people doing the work, that's when you know, you're like, okay, now I can go in and go. So I've been thinking, <laughs> do you remember when I had that brain fart about six months ago about safety <laughs> differently? Let's have that conversation again. I've calmed down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you just mentioned some, but can you tell me about any moments or experiences you had that were formative for you in developing 
your views on safety management? Are are there any aha moments, good or bad, that that stick out? Um, I suppose very early on, it would have been generally people's reactions to me on site when right. you can get quite an allergic reaction from somebody <laughs> on site if you go up and go hey like that's wrong because my clipboard says so and uh, <laughs> you can literally see them tense up going please get out of my face <laughs> so um those experiences would have been quite formative um in me wanting to not do this job anymore which i did probably yeah around three or four years ago tried tried to leave the profession successfully <laughs> But because I was just, I was really jaded with the negativity because it's, it can be, it's seen as a negative role. All you talk about is negative things. Um, so yeah, that would have been quite formative. And seeing the way people on site, like there's been a few times I've been in a room where it will say there's been an induction going on and it's here, sign that method statement. Yeah, it's 75 pages long. Just fucking sign it and get out and do the job. Mm. And that happens more times than it doesn't happen. Right. They might not be swearing, but they're <laughs> it's implied. And, you know, it's this, this crazy voluminous, voluminous documents where, like, that's just ridiculous. Like, nobody is, we all know, like, we all know that nobody's reading them. We all know that yeah. nobody knows what's written in them. We all know there's typos of another job from the previous site <laughs> written in the middle of that document. And nobody gives a shit. Like, they're just, they're just, just keep going. Everyone just, head in the sand as long as you've got the signature like where's when I think of the term consultation in traditional view for me consultation is read it and sign it in new view consultation is help me figure this out we're going to figure this out together right before we even put pen to paper and so if experiences like that kind of pushed you away um what brought you back Ooh, um what brought me back um bills yes yeah <laughs> that is so, a, that is a um, noble that is a noble <laughs> telling you um I had so I'd moved I'd moved home from Australia I had I I I had left my safety job in Australia about three months before we moved home to Ireland and I was like tootling around going oh what else am I going to do and I was thinking I was going to go do social work or something like that and I moved back to Ireland and it turned out that because I had been living away for so long I was no longer eligible for, so here we get um, either free tertiary education or very much reduced tertiary education. Mm. But because I'd been living outside of the EU for more than three years, I wasn't eligible. So I was like, right, that scuppers that plan then. Mm, <laughs> I can't right. go back and retrain as something else. Uh, I tried to get a job in a call center. I tried to get a job as a secretary. I tried to get a job doing literally anything else other than safety. And... I was having no luck and literally the first safety job I applied for, got the interview, got the job. I was like, right, okay. Back I go, back into this. And I was like, oh, maybe it'll be different here. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, but you've, but I, go on. I was going to say, but you've obviously like found some enthusiasm. You're not, you're not sitting here. Yes. You're not engaging on LinkedIn or, or talking on podcasts because you don't like it. No. Yeah. Sorry. That's, that's true. I'm very much in giving out mode at the moment. Um, I was with the current, I had, I had not long started with the company I'm currently with and the, one of the directors was pushing me to go to this, um, IOSH conference. Right. Um, and I didn't want to go, <laughs> but I was like, right, fine, I'll go. And I, and he was saying, you know, you should really try and network and kind of make safety friends. I was like, I don't like safety people. I don't want to make safety <laughs> friends. And so I went to the conference and um, so there was actually two guys doing keynotes there. One was Kevin Furness, who was with Maersk Shipping at the time. And he was presenting on safety differently, which I just thought was amazing. I was like, a couple of years ago, I had been at this workshop in Sydney thinking this will never catch on. And now I'm on the other side of the world. I'm back home. And this is in an IOSH conference. I was like, this is mad. So that kind of piqued my interest. And then there was another guy, Nip and Anand, was presenting as well. Um, he does this fantastic workshop on Costa Concordia, that um, cruise ship that crashed there back in 2012 or 13, I think. Um, and he did a presentation on that. And they both really just took my breath away. I was like, this, 
could be really cool if 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 I was to look at things, I suppose, from a different perspective. And then I started to engage a bit more on LinkedIn. And actually, there's a guy, James McPherson, who has a podcast called Rebranding Safety. Mm-hmm. And I was listening to his podcast and I reached out to him and we just started exchanging messages. And um, yeah, and I just started to find, I suppose, I found like-minded people on LinkedIn that happened to be on this side of the world that um, just just completely flipped the script for me. And then I realized I could go to work and have a good day, and, like <laughs> chat with people and have a nice time and do good work without fighting with people and, yeah, make some sort of an impact or improve somebody's day through safety, which usually it's the opposite. So... Yeah. And I, yeah. I think most people that go into safety do it because they care about people and they want, they mm. want to No, you don't think so. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I wish I hadn't had that reaction. Now. <laughs> I don't think most people go into safety intentionally. Uh, yes. They no, that's there. Yeah. I've heard like, a lot they don't, of that. This, yeah. Like at this whole, it's noble. It's my vocation. Like it might be now, but ain't nobody growing up wanting to be a safety officer. Like, come on. Like it, that's, it's usually I had an incident or I witnessed an incident mm. or something happened in my life and I had to retrain. Like for me, I was working in traffic control in Sydney because I had been a backpacker and that's what backpackers do to make money. And then I decided to stay. So I moved up into management and then it was just a lateral move from there across the safety because mm-hmm. that's what people did. I didn't like... Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of meandering paths into safety, but mm. but there are, you know, there are uh, training programs for safety professionals now. So, um, oh, yeah, now and I mean, those didn't exist before. So now I think perhaps more young people are seeing it as an option as opposed to just maybe being a, a bit invisible to them. Yeah, um, I would I would hope that more young people are seeing it as a viable option. I hope it's piquing people's interest mm. uh, because we need it because we are, generally speaking, on average, a very old, very male, very white profession. Mm. That's what it is. Like the diversity is severely lacking. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to be speaking with someone about women and safety later on this week. So uh, hopefully we can, we'll wade more into that. Um, do you have any advice for novice safety professionals who are maybe just sort of encountering this this debate, these two influences on safety? I would say keep an open mind, read widely, listen to everyone, but may form your own opinion and see what works for you in your practice. Because I really do think it's so individual and it is a practice that um and don't and I know I probably sound like I've very much pinned my colors to the mast on which side I would mostly land on. But like it's to quote James McPherson, it's a buffet. Like you can take, mm. there are so many different theories, so many different systems, so many different approaches. So why just stick to one? You can do anything with it. It's so varied. Um, and there's, yeah, there's so many ways you could approach it. So yeah, keep an open mind and don't get stuck with just one. Okay. And so what would you say to safety veterans who maybe feel that this, this whole discussion, this whole debate between old and new is theoretical and maybe not all that valuable? Um, I would say that I would, I would hope that I try to understand their point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of, I suppose, yeah, safety veterans that have been in the game a very long time, have probably witnessed some horrific injuries or accidents, deaths, all that kind of thing. So I don't think that we should be dismissive ever in that way. Um, But same thing, I don't think they should be dismissive of New View. Um, Now, I think the discussions and the battles that happen on LinkedIn or between some of the academics or some of the big names or heavy hitters are kind of like whatever, their background noise don't really pay attention much anymore. Um, the conversations need to be happening between actual practitioners. Right. And you need to seek those out. Um, I have learned more in the last year. I joined a, a networking group called Project Millennium, and uh, they're based out of the UK. 
but it's all online so you can be anywhere but um there's such a diverse range of experience in that room um and that's where my learning has accelerated my passion for the job has just gone tenfold from engaging with them and that's where the conversations need to be happening so as i think i can't remember i read something the other week that someone was saying about all this fucking navel gazing of just back and forth between new view traditional it's like whatever just get on with it you have a job to, we have jobs to do mm-hmm. and we need to be doing them and we need to make sure that we are at the end of the day that people are at the center of what we're doing that we are reducing and preventing harm to the people in our businesses like that's it so it doesn't it doesn't matter how you get there you just have to make sure that that happens right right um so I have three questions that I ask all my guests, and I'm going to move into those now. The first one is uh, University of Elisa. Um, if you were to develop non-technical training for people studying to be safety managers, where would you start? What, what soft skills are the most important to develop in the next generation of safety professionals? If I could only pick one, it would be empathy. Without that, this whole thing doesn't work. And that is empathy for people at all levels of the organization from CEO the whole way through to the front line because we just have to understand people's perspectives. Um, I think it can be very easy, especially in new view, to be like, oh, we're here for the people at the front line, the people at the point of risk and almost to the point of demonizing management, mm-hmm. which is not helpful. It really creates an us and them divide. Um, and it's like, Jesus, people in management roles have a hard job as well it's not you know they've they've a lot going on i don't i don't envy them um so yeah empathy empathy and using that empathy to understand context because context is everything i would agree yeah (laughs) that is university of elisa (laughs) um if you could travel back in time and speak to yourself at the beginning of your safety career and you could only give one piece of advice to young elisa what would that be? Um, stick with it. It will get better. <laughs> it gets better. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, okay. So now you've actually mentioned throughout a, a bunch of different uh, tools and, and that sort of thing. So, but I'll just ask you now so we can maybe get them together is what do you recommend mm. as, as the best, most practical resources for safety managers, maybe specifically looking to, in, to improve their interpersonal skills. So books, websites, online communities, you mentioned one or, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, online communities, uh, Project Millennium, without, without a doubt, is um, it's a networking group. We do weekly calls. I suppose, yeah, other resources, like there's one resource, it's not exactly, it's not interpersonal, it's very much um, technical, but there's a book called Paper Safe by Greg Smith. And that should be mandatory reading for every safety professional, no matter what your stance is, on new view, on traditional, it's just a phenomenal book on really evaluating your systems and your controls and how confident you are in those controls. So that is that's a fantastic book. Um, the other thing, then, yeah, I mentioned Nippon and Anand has a he does a workshop about the cost of Concordia and about incident investigations and looking at those a bit differently. So if you ever get a chance to attend that, do. Um, it it changed my view on things. Um, podcast. It's not a safety podcast, but um, I'm not sure if you heard of Esther Perel. But I have. She's a. She's what? a. She. I have. Is she the relationship or family? Yeah. She's a marriage counselor, the, essentially, right? Yeah. She is fucking phenomenal. Huh. Like she's unbelievable. Her. She has a podcast called Where Should We Begin, um, and it is all about couples uh, she has another one called how's work um and it's work-based but um just i don't know i just really enjoy it and it it just gives a view on the nuances of communication that i did never expect to take into the workplace but that i do and it just really is i think brilliant listening so last question uh where can our listeners find you on the web uh linkedin that's where i'm at um, by all means, connect, drop a message, um, then actually engage and have a conversation. That would be great. <laughs> there's, 
There's you know when people just connect on LinkedIn and then you're like, hi, hi. are you there? Just, why did you why did you do this? <laughs> just like if you're going to connect, please actually send a message and then we can have a chat. That'd be great. Awesome. Um, so yeah, that's it. LinkedIn. Great. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for joining us, Elisa. And thanks for our listeners, to our listeners for tuning in. And thanks to the Safety Labs by Slice team. Thanks for having me. Safety Labs is created by Slice, the only safety knife on the market with a finger-friendly blade. Find us at sliceproducts.com. Until next time, stay safe.